Welcome to Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. I'm Len Mort. And I'm Dory Cronin. And together we try to bring you some informative programs and uh, keep you updated with what's going on or what's uh, uh, taken place in the past and uh, interesting uh, people. And uh, what do you think, Dory? What else have we done? What else have we done? Well, we've done quite a few neat little trips that have kind of gone back in time a, a little. Yes, we have. And uh, I, I really enjoy doing the uh, back in time. And I understand uh, listening to people, our viewers, on the outside that uh, have commented more on, a, on the past, the programs of the past that we have done. And uh, we've been uh, out on some field trips. Right, down to Rhode Island to the dining car museum. That was really interesting. That was interesting. We had a lot of comments on that. And uh, we uh, did uh, the field trip to Waters uh, Farm. Right, got to see old time farm how they used to do things. And uh, we've uh, just done uh, three other field trips just recently that we're in the process of working on. And uh, this is uh, one of those. And uh, this series of uh, three programs on the past will be titled Lost Arts. And uh, with that, we'd like to uh, introduce our guest, uh, Jesse Massale mm -hmm. from Letter Cabo. Uh, Jesse has uh, quite an interesting talent. He does, and then the neat thing about it is, even though we're kind of traveling back in time a little, he does this right now, so it's current, but it's also from the past, so it's. This is a lost art, a lost trade, and uh, it's, it's really interesting that someone of his age wants to bring this back and not let it die. And, uh, we welcome you here, Jesse. Thank you for having me. It's, it's a pleasure. And uh, we did a, a field trip to your studio, which uh, we will run into during the course of this program. Tell us a little about uh, yourself and uh, why you chose this as a, uh, a craft. Well, um, I'm not even sure if I could say that I chose it. I feel like it kind of chose me. I was uh, studying creative writing in college and uh, it was the sort of thing that was going to allow me to, I think, explore and interpret various things that really interested me. Um, history, tradition, craft, working with your hands. It just I thought I'd always have something to write about. Um, but uh, the more I got involved in my studies, uh, I, I was taking a few courses in, in writing. And, and one of the courses offered at school was uh, an introduction to letterpress printing. Um, and I went thinking I would just sort of get my three credits and then move on. Um, but uh, that, that sort of early exposure to, to type metal, to the smell and the sounds and even the tastes of printing uh, was, was a life-changing event for me. And uh, through printing, I've actually been able to explore a lot of other uh, disciplines that kind of fall under the larger umbrella of the graphic arts. And letter carving is, is sort of the newer one for me, but uh, it's far older than printing is. So um, you are saying that something about the past, and I think it's interesting how you know, the thing, funny thing about the truth is that it's still, you know, even when it's unfashionable, it's still true. I mean, people think of letterpress and letter carving even as things that people did back then that no one does anymore because we've invented methods for doing everything faster and cheaper. Um, but uh, I like to say that the traditional uh, crafts are still good at what they always did. And just because they're not fast or, in some cases, very cheap, uh, they still, I think, have a part to play in our, in our sort of modern graphic landscape. Um, I guess to the extent that uh, I've chosen it, I guess I, I've, I've decided to uh, try to combine the two. I think uh, there are a lot of people who do either or, but there are very few, uh, if any other people, who actually try to do both. So uh, it is a conscious decision in, in some respects because I, I do feel how, uh, I guess, endangered the, the crafts are, but I've been very fortunate to have received uh, outstanding educations in both fields by, by various masters uh, and I've been sort of helped along and I kind of want to learn the traditions the way that they were meant to be practiced so that I can then pass them on to anyone else who might find themselves interested. So it's a slippery slope. <laughs> this uh, carving is, is old school. It it's is, around yeah, for, absolutely. Since time began really. Well and I think, yeah, I mean we've... Technology has uh, 
really taken over a lot of the aspect of the crafts. Right. And it's uh, what impresses me the most is that you are not stepping into the technology area era with it, mm -hmm. but you are, you know, going back to the old school hands-on method right. of carving stone. With that, let's take a trip to your studio. Okay. And uh, I'd be delighted. See the operation. Well, welcome, welcome back to the shop. Uh, we're on the other side of it today, now. Um, we are at my uh, drafting table, which actually belonged to my grandfather. He was a steel engineer. He worked at Morgan's in Worcester for many years. Uh, and so it's nice to, actually a lot of the, my shop, uh, both on the letter carving and the printing side, uh, is sort of a composite sketch of other people's careers. I've inherited uh, presses, type, tools, desks or, or drafting tables from, from different people who've, who've worked in various industries. So it uh, it's certainly takes a village. Um, so let's see, a little bit about the process. Um, as with letterpress, uh, the emphasis being on handwork, uh, letter carving uh, is, is also a product of, of hand tools. Uh, it's very simple, sort of another irreducible combination of, of the mallet and the chisel. Um, the only thing that's really uh, the only real innovation over the last, oh, 2,000 years in, in letter carving uh, as done by hand, not to, not to confuse it with sandblasting, which actually came in the late 19th century and changed everything. Uh, hand carving uh, involves, a, in this case, a tungsten-tipped carbide chisel. Uh, formerly, they were just made of steel. And actually, if, if this were a tr true traditional shop, if I were really trying to, to make it uh, muy authentico, I could use steel chisels and have... Derek re-temper them for me, but um, I, I do avail myself of, of the one innovation that's come along, and that's the tungsten, because it's, it's very hard, and it's durable, and it uh, means uh, less frequent sharpening. So I can actually carve uh, a day, a day's worth of, of, of letters uh, on a single sharpening. So um, the letters that I carve are designed with, uh, going back to the Romans again, uh, with a round ferrule brush. I don't know how helpful this light is. In the moment, but um, it's basically how the Romans did it. They would lay the lettering down on the stone. Someone, either the, a separate craftsperson or, uh, or the carver himself, would lay the letters down on the stone, and the carver would take the chisel and follow along. Um, so I use, uh, I use a sumi ink. I mean, it can be other, other uh, forms of, of paint or, or ink or whatever, but I just like this because it's water-based. Uh, you can extend it. You can get sort of different washes. Uh, so that is, this is actually the, the crux of the whole uh, process because letter carving is, is really quite a straightforward and simple process. I think pretty much anyone who has the inclination and, and, and sort of the basic motor skills can learn how to carve a letter. Uh, the, the, the bottleneck or the, the sort of the, the turning point is, is the lettering itself. How do you design letters? Um, and as a printer you think, oh, well he has cases of type. He could just use his letter forms from that. Well. Uh, I could, but one, the type is very, very small uh, and be very difficult to carve. I could, of course, blow it up if I wanted to, but, uh, but really the, the best method is sort of the oldest method, is the, is the hand lettering, uh, and, and Len can appreciate that as a lettering artist himself. Um, the first thing I do is I, this, this project actually, which I'm in the process of finishing up, is a, uh, a garden piece for my uh, mother-in-law-to-be. Uh, she is a hummingbird fanatic and for her birthday coming up next week uh, her husband, uh, my father-in-law-to-be, uh, commissioned this piece uh, to hang uh, in their backyard. And the thing for me as, as a designer, as a, I guess as a typographer, the thing that I'm bringing to lettering is I'm trying to bring a sensibility to bear on letter forms that are not pre-existing. As a, as a printer I'm using other people's alphabets. I'm arranging them as I see fit. Uh, as a lettering artist, uh, as a letterer, really, um, I have to design them and I have to arrange them in a way that, that pleases me and, and, and the client. So for me, this has been the hardest part is learning how to use the brush. And uh, in my experience uh, working uh, for Nicholas Benson at the John Stephen shop, uh, I guess I should back up a little bit, last spring, uh, after teaching myself what I could over maybe a two-year period, I received a grant to study with Nicholas Benson at the John Stephen shop. 
in Newport, Rhode Island, and the emphasis there is on the brush, and they are wizards at it. They're just amazing what they can do with a brush. Uh, I had no prior training uh, in, in any kind of uh, drafting skills, so for me, this was a very, very difficult process, and it still it continues to be difficult because um, the brush, you're basically controlling liquid. You're pushing water around, and you know water wants to go where it wants to go. And, uh, the control that's required is, is something that takes years and years to uh, to learn. Um, so, based on my training at the John Stephen shop over the last over six weeks last spring, um, I've been sort of devoting myself to perfecting or improving at least the the, the hand lettering aspect. Because um, I knew that when I left Boston uh, and and decided to start up my own shop, I wasn't going to be able to rely on other people's letters for for my carving. So I really really have been working at it. Um, and for this piece, uh, the issue was you have one long line and one short line, and how do you get them to cohere in uh, a design that seems inevitable? Uh, uh, that, that's always the hope, is that it seems like it could be no other way. Um, and that's kind of what I'm trying to do here. I had the idea to wrap it around a circle uh, to stretch the hummingbird out so that it all kind of fits in a single uh, design. So that would be the first part, is you sort of draw your circle and I use a pencil and I sketch out the letters to, uh, to get the spacing sort of approximate. And then I lay down the brush strokes and uh, hopefully I'm, I'm within the ballpark at that point. Uh, the nice thing about this process is that at every stage from layout to, to tracing to finished piece, you can always uh, improve the work. It's never a static thing. You're never stuck with a design. Uh, if you're alive to the process, you can still uh, increase the sensitivity and, and hopefully the, the grace and the, and the loveliness of it. Uh, so here we're kind of working from a relatively rough sketch. And then when it comes time to uh, getting to the stone, you take tracing paper and you go over it very painstakingly uh, with a pencil and you make your, other, your sort of the next round of adjustments and spacing and, and proportion. And, and, uh, and then once you have that, then you lay the tracing over onto the stone, and you take a stylus uh, and some carbon paper, Sorel, which is fairly commonly known, uh, and then you underlay it, and then you trace over your lettering, and then that gives you, as I have here, a uh, sort of a chalk outline of the letters uh, for that. And that was sort of derived from that, that, that overlay there. Uh, in this case, this is a finished product, so we have the stone sort of ready for painting. And the thing that, that really kind of sells letter carving uh, as, as done by hand, and actually I wanted to pick up on a point that Derek made in his segment about how when people think handmade, they're, they're trained now to think primitive and crude, but it's really quite extraordinary what you can get out of simple tools if you know how to use them and you know the, the historical uh, the heritage and something of the lineage that in which they uh, originally existed. Um, you know, this, this for me is a new experience, carving in the round, uh, as it were. But uh, you know, and having letters sort of bend around that, and, and having to make subtle adjustments to the proportions. Like I think it's probably most noticeable in the N, how the outer upright stem is sort of flared out just a little bit to kind of basically. Uh, be consistent with the the, the, the radial quality of, of the circle. Um, they're, they're not just letters kind of planted, they're actually shaped around the circle. Um, so the thing that, that letter carving in this in this way uh, does that, that sandblasting and other sort of modern methods uh, can't do is, is you're putting a V-cut and it's basically a triangular shaped trench uh, into the stone and it's what allows for the very dramatic interplay of light and shadow, uh, depending on the angle of the light. And if you're thinking of a tombstone, it's the angle of the sun passing over the cemetery uh, from, from morning to evening. You're getting kind of a different letter, essentially. You're, you're accentuating a different quality of the letter. And so letter carving uh, really benefits uh, in, in this way. It, it benefits from that because it, it's, it can be so dramatic, whereas with the, the sandblasting, you're creating a rutted, sort of a U-shaped trench, and the light just kind of disappears in there. It's, it doesn't really have anything to bounce off of. So 
again, I'm kind of making a claim for, for the aesthetic value of, of the process. I, I can't compete on uh, speed necessarily, but, um, but there are things that, that this can do, this process can do that, that most people, uh, that, that other processes can't. So that's kind of what I'm clinging to. Uh, and again, it's, it's fun. It's scary because you know, you're removing uh, stone a little bit at a time. Oh, I guess in the last stage is the rubbing. So this is, uh, backing up a little bit, this is how you keep yourself honest. As you're carving, you're, you're relating to the, the overlaid transfer, uh, and that sort of gives you the outline to work from, but sometimes you can be off, the, the, the strokes can be, uh, you know, if you have something that's a little bit too narrow, you can do a rubbing and you can see exactly where you're at. It gives you a much more accurate reflection of the letter shape uh, as, as opposed to what you can see based on what you've carved and the, the remaining outline. So, and it can also be a decorative piece as well. I've I've done uh, I've I've done printing that has incorporated rubbings as well as this sort of like an, a value added <laughs> uh, quality. But um, anyway, so this the next stage for this pro project is to uh, shellac it and uh, paint it, and then once it's all done, unfortunately. <laughs> My press sign is outside, but it would give you an idea of, of what it will look like uh, when it's all painted. But uh, I figure, I guess the best thing to do is just to be do a little demonstration. And if you are so moved, you're welcome to uh, try it yourself. Adjustable bench over there, but uh, that's not a very telegenic way to do it. So we have our outline. This is uh, kind of a, a riff on the traditional uh, SPQR, which uh, if you have ever been to Rome or, or Italy, or if you know anything about Roman history, SPQR was kind of the, you know, the, the imprimatur of the empire. Uh, it stands for uh, Senatus Populus Romanus, and it's basically the Senate and people of Rome. It's like the, sort of the official seal of the empire. So it was everywhere. It was on, uh, you know, memorials. It was on buildings. It was on all sorts of uh, official. Uh, structures and it's it's long been ever since obviously it's been kind of a a plaything of, of letter carvers like I think everyone wants to try their own hand at it and here I've I've done a very uh, perhaps ill-advisedly unconventional layout where I've compressed all the letters and they're overlapping and I think when it's carved it will lead to interesting intersections and, and interplay of, of light and shadow as I as I said um, it's a little sacrilegious but I, I think uh, Nero is, is long dead, Caligula so, is also. So anyway, uh, what should I say about the process? Um, people think you're going in there, you're wailing away at it. They think it must be difficult because you're, 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 you're throwing the hammer. And it's actually uh, quite a delicate and, uh, and quiet uh, repetitive process. It's you're removing a little bit at a time. Uh, you're sort of deepening the, the V cut until you get to your, your outer limits there. So. Um, I guess we'll just start. You start in the center of the stroke. Do a little bit at a time. This actually is slate, but it's a very, it's a very hard slate. I think it's, it's got some iron in it or some, some deposits. Or something. Of course, it doesn't help that it's <laughs> wobbling on me. Uh, not, not an ideal situation, but we'll just rally. that started a little bit and then we so this is where I make my noise Derek has his methods this is mine it's it's not quite as masculine I grant but uh, yeah it's just it's like Chinese water torture just a little bit at a time So 
I'm going to be a little aggressive here because the stone is so hard. Again, as much fun as this is to me, maybe not to others watching it, be another sort of tedious old-fashioned hobby. Um, the nice thing about this is that it's not just sort of mere preciosity. It's not art for art's sake. It's a uh, it's a service. You know, it's I could be doing a house number. I could be doing a gravestone. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, you know perfectly relevant, legitimate, uh, contemporary applications for it. It just happens to be slow and ancient you know it's it's uh and it's not really common uh in the states as much although it's it's quite popular in england um the uh you can actually go to school this like sounds like a fantasy land to me you can go to college to be a letter carver it just it blows my mind uh here you have to be uh you have to either be a New Englander or, or uh, living in Berkeley because there are so few carvers, but most of them are concentrated here in New England, specifically in Rhode Island. Uh, there are probably more letter carvers per capita in Rhode Island than there are anywhere else in the world. Uh, I don't know if that's just because of the stone. It's certainly because of the influence of the John Stephen shop in Newport, which has been in business since uh, 1705. So they've kind of cornered the market on the, the true, uh, the authentic method. Um, but uh, yeah, in England, it's it's still a living tradition, uh, and I think part of the challenge, as I see it, is is not only sharing it with people and 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 you know making a case for it, but uh, but sort of putting it into people's hands, not not having it be this sort of uh, remote, uh, impossible thing. That it's it's something that could be, uh, you know, if you're going to spend money on, uh, you know, a house number or if, if you're going to have a gravestone made, it's certainly worth considering because, uh, I mean, it may be a little bit more, but you're getting a, a different, maybe a higher quality product. Uh, and the thing that I want to try to do is, is it, it, not only to share the work, uh, share my work, but also to get people to put tools in their hands, just to give them, let them try it, because I think some people might actually take to it. And the way that we can actually create a thriving community is to get more people to do it. Um, so I think people who, who you know, pride themselves on, on good work and have the patience and the tenacity um, are ideal candidates. But patience is it's definitely one of the principal virtues for a letter carver. Sometimes the case, if you're having difficult, if you're meeting with difficulties, the stone is hard. You just have to use a heavier <laughs> mallet. Uh, this is a lignum vitae mallet. I found it on eBay. It's got a crack in it, but that doesn't really uh, matter too much. Um, it has a very nice, sort of satisfying heft to it. I don't know if you, I mean, the, the handle is ergonomic, obviously, but just don't you feel like you want to well on something? <laughs> Not on me, preferably, but. Uh, you just feel powerful. I just like Thor. I feel like I want to raise him. Right. 
<laughs> anyway, I'll go back to my letter carrier. Right? This is also a great way to make mistakes faster, uh, a heavier mallet. <laughs> so I'm going to try to be a little careful. So I was saying that sandblasting was uh, the, the, the basically the main innovation in, in letter carving uh, in the last 2,000 years that, that, that really changed the industry. I mean, the tungsten was, was a nice advantage, but uh, sandblasting really kind of uh, pushed the hand letter carver kind of to the side because things were so much faster uh, and, and cheaper because you could remove stone so quickly. Um, and also, uh, as we came of age as a nation, you think, uh, well, the colonial times were the, the age of slate, and then uh, post-colonial into the 19th century, you have uh, marble was the fashion, the neoclassical movement uh, really kind of captured our imagination, and everything had to be white and immaculate and sort of Roman. Uh, and then around about the turn of the uh, 19th century, granite became more in vogue because the sandblasting uh, technique could could just chew through granite. I mean, granite is a, a tremendously dense, hard stone, but it's no match for sandblasting. So uh, from slate to marble to granite, which is where we remain today, most memorial uh, memorials or gravestones are, are made out of granite. Um, but the thing that I, uh, I find interesting is that in, in, in the zeal that the, the, the people felt towards marble and to get everything so immaculate and, and clean, uh, they did these extraordinarily del delicate and, and elaborate uh, inscriptions. Uh, but if you go by any burying ground that started in colonial times and then moved into the 19th century, a lot of the marble headstones have been effaced by weather. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just don't, they're not built to last. Um, but the slate ones are still shining proud. They're still clean. The inscriptions, many of them look like they were done last week. Um, and I think that's one advantage to, to working with slate is that it does retain its inscription for so long. Um, and marble can be fun. I, I did a project recently for a, a book dealer in marble. Um, but uh, the, uh, the, the letter carving uh, in granite is, is trickier because, because it's so uh, such a dense hard sort of crystally uh, stone, it, it's, it's difficult to get delicate uh, refinement sort of details like serifs or, or I mean, you can do it if you're, if you're very good at it, but um, slate, in, in my mind, and I think in the mind of many other letter carvers, is, is the ideal surface because it's so responsive uh, and it's so durable as well. And what's kind of ironic about being a printer and a letter carver is that there's this, if I choose to pay attention to it, there's this sort of historical conflict where in the early 1800s, uh, you know, before the advent of, of type founding in America, around about the late 1700s or so, um, most letter carvers, most if not all letter carvers were working from their own sort of organic conception of what the alphabet looked like. They weren't looking at any other models. They didn't have anyone else to follow. It was all what they could come up with on their own. Um, and once the printers, once printing became more, more firmly established in America, uh, the, the type foundries began producing type specimens. And that became, you know, you get like the, the really dramatic uh, fluctuations between thick and thin strokes. Uh, if you think of Bodoni, as being the exemplar of the transitional typeface uh, around about the turn of the 19th century. Um, the printers essentially put the hand letter carvers, <laughs> at least their, their own lettering, kind of out of business. Um, you know, because the, the, the carvers were like, well, the printers are, are, are using these fantastic, uh, ornate, ornamental display faces. You know, we could do that in stone just as easily. And so a lot of the gravestones that you see from that time period are typographic in nature. Uh, so 
what I'm trying to do as, as a letter carver is try to restore some of the continuity between lettering as, as, as a hand product and not a typographic one. Um, I'm, you know, my type is over there and my brushes are over here and I'm trying to keep the split. <laughs> Uh, because I think once the, the letter carvers kind of abandoned their own uh, tradition of, of hand lettering, uh, the, the quality of memorial inscriptions began to suffer. Uh, and we don't have that rich, continuous legacy of, of hand letter carving in America. It sort of went up from, you know, from the colonial times to the early 1800s and then sort of went through this 100-year desert until about the 1920s uh, when John Howard Benson sort of came back to Newport and discovered the John Stephen shop sort of languishing uh, after, after about 250 years of, of being just a you know, run-of-the-mill shop. Uh, he brought a level of training to, uh, in lettering to, to his work that no one had ever really cared to do. So by his making that decision, uh, he sort of created out of basically whole cloth this, this amazing American tradition of, of lettering and letter carving. And so his son went on to carve the JFK Memorial at the age of 25, and, and his grandson, who was my teacher, Nicholas Benson, uh, recently won a MacArthur Fellowship for letter carving. <laughs> so, I mean, there, there, are, there are pockets of it, but it's not really a national thing anymore. So, um, you know, in my very small way, I'm trying to, you know, raise awareness and share it with the, uh, certainly not with the world, but at least with the town, or whoever will listen or watch. So it's pretty clear that I'm not going to finish this today, <laughs> but I promise you, if you came back tomorrow, it would look something like this. Uh, maybe not exactly like it because the letters are different, but um, let me get some help here. Uh, this is Latin, which uh, I don't understand. I don't read it, but it's an inscription that was found in Sicily. Uh, I think it harkens back to 1 BC, that era. And it's actually just an advertisement for uh, a Roman letter carver's services. It says something to the effect of inscriptions arranged and carved here uh, for memorial for sacred and public buildings. You know, it's pretty boilerplate copy. <laughs> it's not very interesting, but when it's in Latin, it looks real and majestic. And I realize that uh, my most most of my recent projects have been uh, commissions or gifts, and I didn't have any uh, anything new to show or to display. Uh, in the event of, of a fair or a, or a demonstration. And so I just designed this for myself to sort of show on the, basically to, to languish on the, sh the showroom floor of the shop uh, for display purposes. Um, it's carved in slate, it's riven, it's a riven surface. It's, that just means like the natural cleft as opposed to the, this is a polished or a honed surface. So I, I will not go back and paint this because I just, I wouldn't be able to get a crisp uh, coverage because of the basically the inconsistencies in the surface of the stone. But you know, left natural, it sort of has its own presence, I guess. So, would you care to give it a shot? I think it's Lenny's turn. Lenny's turn. Well, he's <laughs> as as the lettering artist, that, that seems only appropriate. Find something. He's not gonna let you do that one. What's that? He's not gonna let you do that one. <laughs> I'm not gonna. He let wanted you, those letters a little I'm not gonna let you show me up. That's right. In my own segment. I mean, how embarrassing. Uh, let's see. This is something that I whipped up. It's fairly crude, but you get the idea. I was uh, at Wellesley College a couple weeks ago as a quote-unquote visiting artist. I don't think of myself in those terms, but I guess wherever I go, I'm visiting. Um, so this is just you know basic strokes, uh, and you can see the students try their hardest. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it takes a long time. So you should see my early work. It's pretty dreadful. Some of my most recent work is pretty dreadful too. Let's see. Oop, that's the one. Just. Let's Are you ready for this? I was ready to deliver it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm used to tools with wooden handles about this long. Okay. All yeah. right. Well, we'll we'll take it easy on you. Um, basically, the one thing you want to remember is you're you're holding the chisel across your palm, 
It's kind of a communication between your thumb and your pinky knuckle. So you're holding it, your fingers fold over, and that's, you know, the, the, the fingers rotate, but it's really the control is in the, in the axis between the pinky and the thumb. So are you right-handed or left-handed? Right-handed. Okay. So you'll hold it in your left hand, uh, somewhat counterintuitively. Um, and basically what you're going to do is you want to remember that you want to keep a 45 degree angle of, from the chisel to the stone and a 45 degree angle from the, the tip of the chisel to the letter. It's, it's like really the only geometry you're going to need to know for this. Um, and you're going to proceed kind of in the center of the stroke. I'll do a little bit just to show you. Kind of start in the middle. And you just remove a little bit at a time. And that, it's a very flaky stone, so don't worry too much about it. Well, I'm very flaky in the <laughs> Well, then this is perfect for you. Well. <laughs> it's a match made in stone. Um, so the other thing you want to remember is, is if you're carving the left uh, plane of the, of, the, of the letter, you're going to be, the chisel is going to be pointing over to the right. It's, just, it's kind of like a rudder. It's uh, one way to think about it. So your, your tools, if you choose to accept them. So the thumb goes on the outside, because if you, if you hold it okay. like an ice pick, you're not going to have any control. And I'll start to get nervous. It is quite heavy for the size of it, isn't it? Yeah, it's about, uh, it's about a pound or so, a pound and a half maybe. Brass, summer zinc. Hmm. So thumb on the outside. There we go. Sneaky thumb. <laughs> so then, yep, you so invert. Like so that. then, yep, and then you're going to hold it. If you can do the left pass, you'll hold it like that. And you can, yeah, you can either invert it or you can... There you go. And I think even if you've never used the tools, you have an instinctive understanding of where it wants to go. So you can make corrections as you're, as you're going along. Right now you're a little steep. So you do one side and then you go back to the bottom and you do the other pass. And then you gradually widen. So you, you've done that side, now let's do this side. Flip it and then turn your hand a little bit to the left. And try to follow in that trench that you've already made. Yeah. You can see where you Yeah, so you want to you want to be a little bit to so the angle that you want to remember is is the angle of the blade, the tip of the chisel to the, the letter and that wants to be about 45 degrees. Like that? Yep. But if you're carving a left, you're going to want to bring your hand over. It's it's a little it requires a little bit of bodily intuition, but you figure it out. There you go. Isn't this fun? <laughs> You're making a mess. I'd rather watch great. paint dry. Yeah? You know? I'm, I'm well, haven't to, haven't I'm you spent your paint. life watching paint dry? <laughs> You're probably I'm, used to I'm that so by now. I'm so used to paint and, and yeah. uh, brushes and you figure once you paint it, why bother, right? Just leave yeah. it, leave it alone. For me, paint is just the, the intermediary process. So it is different than carving wood, though, control and everything. Yeah, so. and, and you don't. I mean, I think with wood, I don't have very a lot of experience carving wood, but my sense is that the grain is something that you just learn to adapt to, whereas mm. stone is a little bit more unpredictable. Uh, you do get a sense of of like this this piece is flaky, but it's not quite as hard. As, as that piece is, so it's, it moves a little bit faster, whereas with that piece I'm going to have to really kind of wail on it. I can see I'm not going to be a stone cop. <laughs> well, I already know I don't have the chops to be a sign painter, so you stay on your side of town, I'll stay on my side. We'll just maintain an uneasy piece. We'll, we'll work on that. Okay, that sounds great. Well, unless you have any more questions, I will thank you for coming by and visiting us. It's been a pleasure. Well, we, we appreciate uh, visiting with you. 
in uh, watching you and you sharing your talents with us. And uh, again, uh, it's a dying art. And uh, that's why we've uh, come to you and we want that art to uh, continue. Yeah, well, I think Derek, both of us, uh, Derek and I feel, uh, here I will speak for him, we feel a tremendous uh, debt of gratitude to the people who trained us. And it just seems like a, the natural conclusion to then pass it on to the next person who wanders through. It's really hard to go out look, looking for these people, and I think maybe the people who taught us just assume that someone would walk in the door, you know. Uh, and fortunately, that's how it happened for them. So hopefully it will happen for us as well. As an artist myself with uh, my trade, there are no new people that want to come and learn that trade, unfortunately. They're not beating a path. Yeah, the there's less, less and less of a pool. Uh, I, I think part of it uh, has to do with lack of outreach, lack of knowledge. People just don't realize it can be done. Um, you know, our, our graphic landscape is, is so mysterious in, in some ways in, in terms of how things are made uh, that a lot of people don't have the hands-on access uh, uh, that, that always was part of the basic training for any graphic designer. Um, so it takes people like us and people like you who do it to be receptive to people who might express an interest and, you know, just be available. And, exactly. Yeah. So. We do what we can. In the meantime, we enjoy our work while people commission it. So it's long live the apps. Yeah, indeed. Cheers. I'll shake to that. <laughs> thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you for coming by. It was a pleasure. So we're back in the studio. Thank you, Jesse, for showing us your, your workshop. That was a pleasure. I hope you learned something. I thought it was very interesting. I was fascinated. And, and I've done old school carving on wood and other materials, but not stone. And uh, I did try it. And I am definitely telling you right now, <laughs> I am not going to be a stone carver. So you're not my first apprentice then. <laughs> <laughs> the search yeah. continues. But we, we thank you for coming. And uh, with that, we usually end our program with words of wisdom. And this program will be, uh, the words of wills, wisdom are, it is not how much you have that makes people look up to you. It's who you are. Till next time. Good night.